Hey everyone, welcome to another AI conversation. Today I'm with Mr. Leon Como, uh, who I met through a common uh, acquaintance. Hi Leon, welcome to a, uh, AI conversations. Hello Doc, happy Sunday. Uh, thank you for the chance to talk with you today. Yeah, so I was saying uh, our common ano, acquaintance is Miss Rosario Kahukom Bradbury. Yeah. You know, at that time she was uh, executive director of CCAP. And I remember we were we were supposed to have ano, coffee at ano, sa peninsula. And then sabi niya, I should have just asked ano, my friend to come. You should meet him. No, He thinks like a scientist, engineer, etc. Sabi ko, sino kaya itong taong to? And then finally, when we met, uh, I think I was headed to Los Baños to give a talk in UP, which we can talk about later. No. Uh, I didn't consider that a very successful talk. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyways, okay, enough about me, more about you. No? So, Leon, um, I'm sure you're quite well known in the, uh, especially in the BPO uh, circles. But for the rest of uh, the world who needs to know who you are, I think, can you give us a brief background on yourself? Yeah, first of all, is, uh, of course, thanks to Mam Rosario. Uh, it's been a big help for me uh, in my career in SGS and also uh, the one who introduced um, uh, you to me. And then, um, of course, you know what happened. I chased you to your talk in Los Banos and the rest is now to this point. Yes. And yeah, about myself. So, uh, yeah, I came from a quite very different background as from the usual. <laughs> so... Um, I'm an undergraduate uh, mechanical engineering student in PBMIT. That's the uh, Pablo Bourbon Memorial Institute of Technology in Batanga City. And uh, there's a joke about it that it's the provincial branch of Mapua. So <laughs> that's why it's uh, PBMIT. But uh, that school is quite famous. And um, But I was not able to complete my mechanical engineering course in there. But after that, um, I've been through a lot of jobs. Uh, I think around eight formal jobs before I got to this uh, this opportunity to work on a product, which is a uh, device that protects TV sets from lightning. And uh, that that's what I did for three years from wait, 1995 wait. So you to invented, 1998. You invented this device? You know, can you tell yes. us more about it? Sige nga. This is uh, yes, it's, it's a very it's, rare thing no, to hear about an inventor. Sige nga. Yes, it's quite simple. Actually, um, it you can compare it to the paper clip, to the invention of the paper clip. That's what the um, uh, head of the engineering in um, Samsung Electronics told me. Because I've been I've been going from uh, one factory to another, to Sharp, to Samsung, uh, pitching the idea to them that uh, maybe you can help me to manufacture this because I think it will sell. And um, the, the, um, I think the name of the engineer, I, I cannot remember, I think Engineer Baloro of Samsung Electronics told me, you should actually patent it because uh, even if it's quite simple, I think it's a good idea. And uh, if you think of paperclip, it's been patented and it's been recognized as a good invention. Uh, and because what I'm saying, I'm telling him is it's so simple. <laughs> I don't think that it's it's really worth patenting it, but we need to produce it because I think we can sell it. And, so so uh, wait, it 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 absorbs uh, electricity because dati TVs were tama ba? connected to antennas, and then you have storms, or is this via cable? Paano ba? Yeah. Um, even myself, I'm thinking how I got that idea because it's just happened that one day I'm thinking of things to do. And it just occurred to me, ah, um, looking at the TV set, it's connected to the antenna and the antenna is somehow prone to lightnings or to electrical uh, surges coming from the outside. Um, because there's a related incident to that, but I don't know if it's connected because it's in my memory, it's not really connected. But uh, there was that incident that... Um, and me and my friend is trying to set up a television antenna uh, at the roof uh, um, of my uh, uh, aunt's house dun sa bahay ng ninang ko. Nung itinataas na namin yung antenna, sumabit siya sa high voltage wire. And nag-brown out, actually, nag-brown out na ng buong Batanga City <laughs> dahil doon sa ginawa namin. And, uh, no, because there was a power surge. 
there was a power surge and nasunog yung TV nung ninang ko. And maybe it's connected to that. That's why I came up with the with the idea. And um, we are fortunate that we are alive because if, if kung yung power surge na yun is dun pumunta sa amin nung kaibigan ko, malamang tustado kami dun. <laughs> Kasi 20 kilovolts yung line na sinabitan. And that's how it that idea occurred to me. And then I'm what I did is I'm going around different uh, manufacturing companies, mostly on electronics, uh, pitching, as I said, pitching them the idea. <laughs> but uh, they are interested and they are actually helping me to test it because they have equipments to test if it will work. If it's uh, because the first thing is you need to make sure that um, uh, that very simple device is not going to interfere with the signal that's getting into the television sets. And it's not, there's a bit of a loss, but it's not that much. It's, neg it's negligible. And then second is you need to test if it will really stop the power surge and it will really uh, save the television set if the power surge happens on the signal supply line. And I'm still, I still have that very ugly prototype <laughs> with me. I'm carrying it around and um, we are testing it. And it works. It works each time. Uh, and uh, we are testing it for a 300 ohms signal supply line. That's the plot wire. You know, if you can remember the antenna, antenna those days is the uh, the uh, VHF and UHF antenna. Oh, I was going to say VHF, the RF cable. No? Yes, and yes, uh, yes. And then uh, um, the line pa niya nun is yung 300 ohms na plot wire. Hindi pa yung coaxial cable na ginagamit sa cable television industry. Yeah, that's how it happened. I, I only course. remember this was obviously uh, when I was a kid, we used to play computer games a lot. Ganun ang linyahan eh, diba? If you have a, if you have an Atari or a family computer, RF cable siya eh. <laughs> Para kung hindi pa uso yung VGA cable eh, at that time, no? So yep. you, you literally had to switch to channel A1, channel 3 at or channel 5 on your colored colored TV because not everyone had a colored TV so you could play Super Mario Brothers no that was me <laughs> <laughs> that's how i remembered it no but yeah okay sige. so yeah so you're an inventor and then you were going around the uh, jobs and then ano ba? what what ha what brought you to finally to kind of the 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 job that made your career yeah, that invention helped me a lot because it funded me for three years. Because naka, finally, nakakita ako na magpipinans, which is a, a businessman. Uh, hindi siya electronic manufacturing company. He's a businessman who's doing this direct selling of uh, power on um, power on delay na devices naman para da. Dahil di ba yung brownout during those days is sobra-sobra. Uh, daily yung brownout, tapos nasisira yung mga appliances then meron silang product na power on delay ang ginagawa nun is uh, pag uh, nag brown out tapos bumalik yung kuryente hindi niya muna bubuhayin yung mga appliances mo i-delay niya para hindi pumasok yung surge which is related dun sa sinasabi ko naman na yung surge coming from signal supply line uh, na medyo rare pero pag nangyari sunog talaga yung TV so na appreciate niya tapos um, tinulungan niya ako may manufacture and then um, yun nabenta naman namin uh, at uh, uh, talagang grabe yung markup <laughs> so hindi nga ako makapaniwala na mabebenta pala to sa ganito kala taas na halaga and um, that funded me for 3 years of travel all over the Philippines yun din yung nag-introduce sa akin on being able to learn how to use computers dahil kailangan pag-aralan kung paano i-market yung product, uh, nagre-research ako kung paano siya gawa ng mas magandang packaging, etc. And kung paano introduce kung paano siya i-introduce sa mga potential na bibili. Tapos umiikot din ako nun sa mga, ano, sa mga cable television industries. Nakarating ako nun sa Sky Cable, sa <laughs> Home Cable. Dahil sabi ko sa kanila, um, kung tulungan niyo ako na gawin ito na pulido, ma-manufacture na maganda, I think you can make it as a standard component ng linya nyo para hindi uh, magkakaroon ng risk sa subscriber. But then what happened is, uh, I think a different thing happened. Uh, somebody figured out a better way of doing it to protect. Uh, so uh, someone uh, did a better version that. or a totally different approach? A totally different approach. Um, I think um, ang pinaka ano doon na na-realize ko, ah, kailangan ko na i-give up is nung Pinajoin ako nung uh, boss ko sa trade fair sa World Trade Center. 
Tapos nung ko nakita ko, ang dami na palang kakompetensya. <laughs> na iba Were you still na able ako. to sell your stuff even with the competitors? Uh, so Oo, oh, kasi ang um, ano nun is parang binibenta mo siya as insurance eh. Uh, yung naging approach ng boss ko. Kaya napakamahal ng presyo. Uh, dahil sabi ang deal namin nun is, okay, you, you install this device sa inyong TV sets. Pag nasira yung device is papalitan namin ng bago. Pag halimbawa nasunog for whatever really? reason. Wow, ganun kalakas ha. So you could basically guarantee the TV set using this device. But in the meantime, you're earning this incremental cash flow. Parang insurance, no? Oh, parang kasi, insurance kasi hindi na, naman kasi... lahat tatamaan ng kidlat, right? Oo, oh, medyo na, na-realize namin, rare naman talaga yung mismong talagang tinatamaan ng lightning. Ang medyo risky is yung sa cable supply line kasi <laughs> pag biglang isang linya yung tinamaan, ang daming madadamay na TV sets. Pagka lahat yung kliyente namin, syempre lugi. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in effect, of course, this is just me thinking like, because uh, my background is in finance, no? You were selling a device, but actually what you were selling was insurance, basically. That's right? how it works in a way. But of course, uh, technically, you're just working around the system that you are selling a device. But actually, it appears as if it's an insurance of the TV set. Yeah, well, and from Lightning, from a, which from a, is from a cash flow standpoint, it, it will behave like an insurance policy. Na meron lang device, no? Yes. And hopefully, the, the premium, is it a one-off premium or a subscription? Pays for the cost of the, the thing, right? It's one up, it's one up. But um, the thing is, of course, you you're only as good with your commitment for as long as your company is surviving. Right. <laughs> Pag wala na yung kumpanya mo, paano kang paano makakapag-claim yung mga bumili, di ba? That's yeah. that's the risk that the buyers are. Yeah, you know, taking. in hindsight, champre is all under water under the bridge, no? But I would probably. Magkano benta nyo nun? Do you still remember per device? How much yeah, I'm I'm able to manufacture it. Uh, kaya siyang i-manufacture sa at uh, lowest cost na siguro around 30 pesos each device. Pero I'm uh, manufacturing it around 50 pesos. And then we are selling it at around 1,200 yung pinaka na one, na one off, no? Uh, yes, one off. You know, you, we, you could have, syempre, a water under the bridge, imaginary na lang to, but you could have sold it for a subscription of 100 pesos a month. So you can protect yourself for a year for one, two. And then we guarantee you upgrades as and when. Or if the device becomes defective, you can return it. and will replace it immediately. Yeah. <laughs> so after the first year, you're now earning over and above what you were supposed to earn. One, one two lang, one off, diba? And that would have made an, a little extra money that you could have covered your or your, your claims. No? Kasi ang insurance may ganyan. Eh. Patak lang ng patak, forever. <laughs> Or maybe it's a five-year plan. <laughs> I'm thinking. So actually, the the lifetime value is six thousand per person, for which you would have manufactured fifty pesos. Gosh, no! Imagine my. Oh, uh... it's yeah. <laughs> Nung naisip ko siya, sabi ko, kasi ako simply lang ako magcalculate. So binibilang ko ilan ba nagresearch ako ilan ang television sets sa Pilipinas. Ako makuha ko lang yung ten percent ng market. That's going yeah. to make me a millionaire. Oh, for sure. Ganun naman ang calculation for any. Eh. Uh. Ganun ako nag-isip nun. Ganun yung drive. Ganun yung ambition. Kasi you just want to make your first million. Di ba? And then I don't know, how much was a TV back in the day? Couldn't have been more than 6,000? Ah, the, siguro yung cheapest nun is around that. Hindi, mas mahal pa ang TV set yun. Surprisingly. 12,000? Uh, Ganun? Uh, Ganun? Relatively, mas mahal pa ang television sets nung time na yun kaysa ngayon. Um, relatively. Kasi I remember uh, back in the day when I was a when I was a child, parang the magic threshold for anything expensive was ten thousand pesos. Pag sinabing naka gis mil ka millionario ka na. Yep. Ngayon, Pero nung time na yun, 10, yun yung may mga TV sets pa na yung mga flat screen TV nun is mga 200,000, 500,000. Ah, okay. So that's relatively recent. Yung Halo, mga we're, plasma we're talking about 80s. television sets. Yeah, the plasma, that was an interesting trend. Mga, oh, mga six digits yun, no? And, yeah. and mga people, talaga payayaman lang ang nakakabili no? At, so that was the target market for you you were targeting the 200k crowd kasi yun yung mga nagbo-burn out agad no? pag may surge sa, sa, si, uh, sila yung syempre gusto lang ma-insure yung TV sets nila so pag nag-advertise kami noon Sunday mag-advertise kami niyan sa Manila Bulletin Inquirer 
Ah, uh, pwede bang magbanggit dito ng mga <laughs> newspaper? Yeah, so, of course. Wala naman tayong sinasabing masama sa kanila. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, nag-advert- mag-advertise kami sa kanila. Monday morning yan, nandun na yung mga tawag. Ang karamihan sa mga tumatawag, gagaling sa advertisement, yun talaga mga ganun. Mga mamahali ng yung TV sets nila. So, uh, Magallanes Village. Um, I think, um, nakapasok ako sa mga malalaking bahay na talaga nininerbius ako. Kasi sabi ko, pag nasira ako kahit isa sa mga TV set na to, tapos na ating that, career nito. That's it. That's it. You're gonna owe someone for for everything. No? Tama, tama. You're right. Okay. Sige. So, so you were doing the inventor gig for three years. And then what happened? Yeah, what happened is, um, noon nga, nung narealize ko na uh, um, mukhang dead end na. Kasi uh, yung boss ko rin is parang nag-struggle na rin yung business. Um, medyo na parang saturated na yung market. Though marami pa rin yung interested na ibenta yung device kasi tingin nila is marami pa rin mabibentahan. Uh, but then medyo-medyo naging mahirap na yung cash flow. Uh, naghanap na ako ng work. So, and then I I got married. So, you know, uh, I got married. So that, I think that tends that, to think to change things now once you get married. Uh, yeah, that changes my perspective because taking chances on an invention and uh, by the time is nagisi parang ako. If I'm able to do that, maka I can also think of something else that I can work on and then uh, it can be sold. And um, nung, nung pagkakasal ko nga, ganun pa rin ang first few months after my marriage, is yun pa rin yung pinupursu ko. Pumupunta ako sa mga malalaking companies. Uh, nagpipitch ako nung baka pwede pang ituloy na mag-compete dun sa mga nabanggit ko na nakita ko sa World Trade Center ng mga competitor. <laughs> baka pwede makaproduce na mas maganda rin, mas produce ng labanan. Tapos pulido, pero talagang mahirap, mahirap makapenetrate. Kasi wala pa lang... Ganon dito sa Pilipinas na sila yung mag initiate ng manufacturing na large scale. Lahat is almost coming from somewhere else. Ah, you mean we don't have a manufacturing base? Kasi we abroad. Have, we have, but uh, oh. they are manufacturing based on contracts from other countries. Ah, uh, hindi katulad sa abroad. Anyone can just have something fabricated quite quite simply. No? Dito, fabrication is, is it hard to do pag gaganyan? Oh, hindi sila basta makapasok sa kagaya ko na coming from nowhere <laughs> and then they'll try to do it. They will have to go through that maze of uh, having those approvals from those for which they have contract with. Kaya medyo mahirap uh, pag gano'n ang diskarte. Makakap- mapuproduce ko siguro yun. I have to do it myself. I have to uh, come up with a good manufacturing system. I have to, uh, <laughs> you know, it's going to be a lot of investment from my side, of which obviously I don't have that money at the time. Yeah, actually you're talking about something that I'm also quite passionate about, which is it's really hard to set up a startup in general. You know? And I've only been doing startups na are digital in nature you know data products that's already quite hard well, in your case you need physical products no you're manufacturing a device i wouldn't know where to start you know kaya yun nga if you want to sub- have something fabricated you need a manufacturer to carry your 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 design your blueprint produce it and then you have to market it and then that's the only time you can complete the cycle. So, lalabas, money out ka muna on your prototype for a long time, perhaps. No? So, it requires capital. And then, when you go naman to the investment side of the place, I was talking to Blair Castro, who's a ano naman, marketing AI entrepreneur. Ganun din. It's hard to source investment. So, investor culture in the Philippines is bokya. Sorry to say it, ha? mga VC, mga bokya yeah. kayo lahat. <laughs> you have no way of supporting real startups and innovation. And I'm assuming these are the good VCs pa. There's actually a lot of evil VCs whose goal is to either edge you out, take over your business, or ibabangko ka, assuming you're a threat to their mother conglomerate. No? Anyway, sorry. Uh, na side yeah, that, tayo doon. That's, that's a good segue, Doc, kasi that reminds me yung advice mo sa akin na uh, not to go into uh developing apps or system kasi mahirap ang labanan uh it's a lot of investment and then uh, there's no guarantee that napakaliit talaga ng chance to be successful from where we are at the moment uh 
And I think that's the reality. That's why nung nag-usap tayo, kahit maraming ideas, kasi ang dami natin may isip, di ba? Uh, we can develop these apps and maybe it can, users will love it and then they will use it and then we will be rich. But <laughs> if, uh, if you come to really think um, deeply about it, it, that's not the way that it, it's not that easy. Uh, you really have to go through a lot of things and um kailangan maglinya-linya mga bituin para mangyari. Yeah. Uh, the, the odds of quote-unquote success are quite slim, honestly. From um, here, yes. I from think the Philippines. So. Your odds of survival, a little better. So most entrepreneurs I meet, even yung mga... I would also distinguish between founders and entrepreneurs, per se. I mean, everyone's an entrepreneur no, in that space. Pero pag founder ka kasi, that implies... You're kind of going the VC route and you're going to get some investors to back you. Uh, while entrepreneurs usually are self-funded, usually. And maybe they do something a bit more uh, practical. <laughs> practical. See, mga founders, by default, your ideas are impractical. And so you need someone who believes in your dream and who will not try to screw you. Ang problema, yung, down, yung downside ng getting an investor is sometimes you become an employee of the investor. They call the shots. And unfortunately, in, most investors don't know the first thing about innovation. They just happen to have some money lying around. You know, problema. And they're reinforced by their own success. Maybe they were executives who retired with their cash. So the, the instincts that got them rich are not the same instincts you need to become an entrepreneur. I know this because I was in both camps. Eh? I was, uh, I would say, a relatively successful employee. Yeah. And then midstream, I said, before I become completely corrupted <laughs> by employment, I quit. And then I learned the hard way of becoming an entrepreneur. And then entrepreneur muna ako. I never became a real founder per se because I could never agree with an investor. The one time I entertained an investment, ganun nga. Parang ang intention pala niya is to convert me into an employee. Palaging ganun. Yeah. And then we had a, a breakup, quote unquote. We just decided to have a beer and then call it quits. But that was that was a wasted for me opportunity, Majimo. I spent a year working on that concept only to find out that it's not pan out because it's different values of investor. And then later, when we decided to call it quits, I had been out of the business development for a year. So I don't clients no, for the near term. You have to replant the seeds. So that was a painful experience. So now I'm very worried. No. So anyway, sige, back to you. Um so after your inventor era, uh what what made cuz I understand after that you moved eventually into a a role where you met Rosario, no? I don't know, may nangyari pa ba in between before you went into ano? Uh Ayun, nung the... nung hindi na ako makakuha ng magmanufacture ng device and uh, I also have uh, other ideas pero <laughs> ang mabiga masakit na realization ng technology is changing quite a lot kasi meron din akong idea dati na Uh, the way that you can somehow efficiently automatically clean yung VHS tapes. Kasi VHS tapes pa nun, di ba? Cassette tapes nung time na yun. Pero biglang napalitan ng CD. So, <laughs> obsolete, outright, obsolete yung anumang idea na meron ka related to the technology that you think you can somehow leverage yung technology ng VHS tapes, cassette tapes. Nung palitan siya ng compact disc, na-realize ko, napakahirap mag-survive sa environment na to kung yan yung ipoporsyon mo. Uh, yung pagbabago ng technology, bumibilis, at obsolete ka agad. Mag-invest ka, tapos biglang obsolete ka kaagad. Wala na. It's total loss from uh, from your side. So, sabi ko talaga hindi ko kaya tong risk na to. Kasi may bebenta ko siguro lahat ng anumang meron ako, pero at the end of the day, uh, we may end up with nothing. And then, hindi, hindi na ako pwedeng mag-risk too much. Kasi nga, I'm married, at uh, pregnant na yung wife ko. So, naghanap na ako ng work. So, uh, traditional way, di ba? Ayaw ko, kung inabot mo pendok, um, bibili ka na naman ng jaryo, tapos titingnan mo yung mga job ads sa jaryo. Oh, I remember the classified ads very well. And then later, nag-mutate siya into the, parang, naging standalone din siya, di ba? Yung buy and sell and all that. Dati, it was yes. part of the newspaper and then it became something of its own. Yeah. Anyway, sige, tapos, back. Kinain na ng internet, yung Job Street. <laughs> I think Job Street is the first one here in the Philippines uh, or maybe the second one. Um, but going back, yung paghanap ko ng work is yun. Doon ko na nakita yung 
SGS uh, and then um, sabay-sabay yun, inapplyan ko tapos uh, interesting pa nung time na yun, di ba? Wala naman tayong cellphone noon. Wala din kaming telepono sa bahay. So nakiusap pa ako sa Bayantel. Sabi ko dun sa tao sa Bayantel. Boss, pag may yung number, pwede bang itong number nitong brands mo? Ah, so naki, nakiline ka sa kanila na if anyone oh. calls through your this phone, refer it to me. Wow, that's awesome. Oo, oh, kasi wala akong way. Sabi ko, naghahanap ako ng trabaho, pero paano ako tatawagan ng employer ko? Wala akong sariling line sa bahay. Uh, tapos, paano ako malalaman kung tatawagan nila ako? So, nanap ko yung bayan, tell. I have to be creative. Eh. <laughs> We have to be resourceful. Uh, so, kinausap ko yung, mabait naman yung pumatao. Sabi ko sa kanya, basta anong number nyo dito pag dito kayo tatawagan? Sinabi naman niya sa akin, boss, pwede bang yan yung i-declare ko na number doon sa mga inaplayan ko? Tapos pag may tumawag ako yung hinahanap, pakikuha mo na lang yung yung ano, yung ano message. Tapos uh, dadaan ako lagi dito araw-araw, kukuhanin ko sa'yo. Bayaran ko na lang sa'yo yung cost of the call uh, for that. Tumpawayag naman siya. Sabi niya, kahit nga hindi ka magbayad, basta ibibigay ko sa yung message kung may tatawag. Sabi sa'yo. <laughs> that was very nice of them. This is pre-internet, obviously. No? This pre- yeah, this is that's uh, yun yung panahon na yun, Adbima, may mga boot pa na matatawag ka sa telepono for long distance or anything like that. Uh, magbabayad ka sa may payphone pa noon <laughs> during those times. That's 1999. And doon na tumawag yung mga may ina-applyan ko. Eh, na-hire ako sa isang hardware. Magre-report na nga lang ako eh. Pero tumawag yung SGS. And then nung nagsabay-sabay na yung offer, tapos magpa-final exam na rin sana ako nun sa GU Logistics, saka sa PEDEX. Tumawag yung SGS, yun. Uh, mas mataas yung offer kay dun, kaysa dun sa hardware, of course. <laughs> so, kaya dun ako napunta. At dun na nga, dun ko na meet si Ma'am Rosario. Siya yung nag-introduce sa akin, uh, sa'yo. Uh, na- anyway, wait, wait, just to make sure. Uh, so at that time, you, you're still an undergrad at this time. No? Uh, and you were offered the job. Was that ever a challenge at that time to... Kasi ngayon, I think that's a big contention for many career shifters. No? People are really looking for credentials. No? So in your case, how was that? Ah, yun yung isa sa medyo <laughs> talagang dadaan ka sa butas ng karayom minsan. Kasi dun pa lang sa advertisement, sa job ads pa lang, lahat dun ang nakalagay, kailangan college graduate ka. And may mga degrees pa na nakalagay kung anong dapat natapos mo. Or anything. Um... Pero hindi ako natakot. Sabi ko, kahit hindi, kahit hindi ako graduate, hindi naman ako magsisinungaling, pero ipu-forward ko yung application ko. Uh, na, magiging silent lang ako pagdating dun sa, sa kung ano yung natapos ko. Pag sasagutin ko na lang during the interview. Kasi ang sabi ko is, the, my only chance is to get that interview. Kasi yun lang yung chance ko na patunayan na kahit hindi ako graduate, is, <laughs> kaya kong gawin yung trabaho. Kasi uh, medyo uh, dun sa naging karanasan ko, sa naging background ko naman is I think I have capabilities. Um, I've done a lot of research. I've done a lot of work dun sa invention ko. And uh, I actually talked to a lot of people. I've learned a lot. And um, yun. Nung sa SGS, syempre college graduate pa rin nakalagay. So ako, pag in-eliminate ako, dahil dun sa, dun sa requirement na yun, wala akong magagawa. Uh, that's that's it. I I just need to uh, accept that. Kasi may backup naman ako dun sa hardware. Eh, dun sa hardware, na-interview na ako. <laughs> Sabi niya, uh, inamin ko naman na hindi ako college graduates. Eh, Siyempre, hardware yun. Na magiging trabaho ko, salesman. So, okay lang sa kanila. Dahil during the interview naman siguro, medyo na-convince ko nila sila na pwede ko naman, kaya ko naman gawin yung work. Eh, dun sa SGS, nung na-interview ako ni na Ma'am Rosario, tatlo sila, panel interview yun. And nung pumasa ako sa interview, sabi ko, sana naman hindi ma-technical dun sa, sa credential. And interestingly, hindi naman nga naging reason yung credential ko para ma- hindi ako ma-accept. Uh, so they allowed me to start. And then of course, dahil <laughs> alam kong tagilid ako, kailangan masipag ka. <laughs> Kailangan pa bibo ka. Kailangan talaga lahat ng itinuturo nila i-absorb mo tapos patunayan mo na kaya mong gawin yung yung work. And no, I I do. I wanna person, personally highlight what you did, no? Kasi a lot of thing, a lot of people these days, mga lalo na mga uh, fresh grads, partida graduate na yan. Ha? 
they suffer from imposter syndrome. Now they think they're not qualified. And there's a difference between qualification and credential. Yep. And I think, yeah, the job market puts too much premium on credentials. Credentialism nga ang ibig sabihin nun. And I hate that. You know? That's why ako rin eh, I've been anti-credential all my life. No? Um, to the point na minsan it becomes a contention. No? Like, I, I'm not a doctor. You know? People assume I'm a doctor because I'm called doctor. Sabi ko, that's my name. And then they all start, parang you pull the rug from under them. Ha, talaga, hindi ka pala PhD. No? I teach PhDs though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alam mo yun? Or I don't have a master's degree. I wrote one. And then they're like, everyone just goes crazy, you know? And I'm saying, I don't have credentials that I pay for. And they say, what do you mean you pay for credentials? No, I I earned my credit. No, you paid for your tuition fee, didn't you? Napapatigil sila dun, di ba? So you bought your credential. <laughs> At that point, sarado na, no? I mean, the yeah, credentials I have are credentials I earned without having to pay for them. They awarded those to me. Kaya minsan napapatahimik yung mga tao sa ganyan. Ikaw, you went the extra mile, no? You you took a gamble. I think people should 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 be should learn from what you did. And at the end of the day then, you need you there are open-minded managers out there, no? Who think Kasi I think it's just laziness of HR sa totoo lang eh. Kasi it's hard eh. Parang Parang requiring a college diploma is a good convenient filter. Diba? And you filter out. O sige, malamang, ka, dahil na may diploma ka, you probably know something. Pero you also let in the bad guys eh, with the diploma. <laughs> and you rule out the, the good guys without the diploma. So I find that a very uh, superfluous uh, you know, uh, system to say the least. Uh, and then may mga tao who actually stack credentials. Ah. Dami, no? I'm, I'm just not going to name names, no? but I know a few people. They actually have PhDs in multiple campuses. I don't know how they got them. Malay mo naman talaga. Pero sabi ko, kung ganyang kakatalino, you should be a billionaire. No? Malay ko ba kung billionaire na sila? <laughs> Parang <laughs> kung ganyang kakagaling. Or unless it's just paper. Paper credentials. No? So it's a very interesting extreme. No? Pero yung totoo naman is, how do you assess someone who's really qualified for the job, really willing? And in your case, parang baliktad yung nangyari. I don't hope you don't mind. I'm commenting on that. No? Parang because you did not have the credential, you felt obligated to put your best work in. Is that really ironic na yung wala pang credential, yung napipilitang gumawa ng extra mile? When that should be the default for everyone. And then yung mga may credential, lulusot, and then they slack off. Anyway, I'm making just a very polar comparison of the stupidity yeah. of the job market at the moment. Anyway, no, I have, na trigger uh, lang ako. Uh, Sorry, Leon. Uh, <laughs> pero, Doc, medyo, medyo, medyo iba ng konti yung take ko dyan. Eh. Kasi uh, yung kagaya natin is maybe, um, let's say, it's an exception to the rule. But then the rule will always prevail. Kasi the rule is, of course, you need to have the institutions, the educational system. It's part of the whole system that somehow filters and directs people uh, on their respective careers and uh, you need to prove yourself along the way uh, for you to get to the next step na pag na-prove mo yung sarili mo sa elementary then you prove yourself sa secondary and then meron pa tayong NCE nun di ba na parang yun yung uh, channeling kung saan karir ka dapat pupunta pag medyo mababa ang score mo vocational courses ka tapos pag mataas yung score mo then you can go into uh, higher uh, learnings uh, or aspiration of uh, educations. Um, I think I respect that. And um, I think yung mga nakakalusot na kagaya natin na medyo exceptional yung path, uh, hindi tayo dapat, uh, uh, ibantay ko daw, hindi tayo dapat yung maging model. Ang kailangan talagang maging model is yung norms. But sana hindi maging excuse yung norms na pag nakuha mo na yung credential is yun na yung sasabihin mo sa sarili mo na I should be paid more because I have these credentials. I think it's still, at the end of the day, uh, regardless kung ano man yung background natin, kung ano man yung credentials, pagdating na dun sa trabaho is, ang maging attitude talaga dapat ng kahit sino is um, you need to prove yourself pa rin sa work. Because iba yung ano eh, pinag-aralan mo. Iba yung, itin, iba yung theory sa practice. Kasi 
um, no matter uh, how good were the teachings, tourist pa rin yun. Siyempre may mga apprenticeship. Pero alam naman natin, pag pinadala ka yung OJT, ang pinapagawa sa iyo is mga menial jobs. Hindi ka naman talaga ini-immerse sa dun sa talagang totoong trabaho. Talaga ang magiging immersion mo is pagka ipinasok ka na sa work. Yeah. Kaya, uh, ang request ko lang dun, dun sa may mga magagandang credentials, take advantage of that because of course, that's your entry point. Yun yung parang filtering. Mga, nakalusot ka na dun sa isang filtering. But there's another filter after that. And that's really learning what the job requires of us. At ang naging advantage nung kagaya natin is pag binigyan tayo ng pagkakataon na mag-work is talagang medyo may may ano tayo, may deeper hunger tayo to learn more. Kasi wala nga tayong nung credential. But I think it should be the same for those people who have credentials. I think, well number one, yeah, I agree with most of what you said. I think you're also being too nice. <laughs> I tend I tend to be quite inflammatory about these things because you're correct, the norms prevail. But the norms are not good right now. No? We are a dismal player in the innovation space. Uh, our education statistics are declining. So if that's the norm, I'd say gun to be the exception. You have to rise above the crap. Crap. <laughs> and uh ito pa, isa pa to. This is gonna be a sticky point for many people, especially mga young ones. Because of the norm, how many of our promising inventors, founders, innovators, sana didn't embark on their path because they had parents who forced them into the norm. Uy, mag ano ka, engineer ka kuha kang lisensya mo, mag-doktor ka, or mag-nurse ka para, ka mag, para makapag-abroad ka. Para... So, I think it's well-intentioned. I don't know how many parents will actually discourage their children from going to college. I think that's the default. But that is precisely the, the norm that has put us in this, I'm going to say us, this country, no, in this kind of position. Na, buti na lang pala, I didn't listen to my parents too much. I listened enough. <laughs> I got my degree. I even got a cum laude pa nga eh. When, back when it meant something, pasang awang cum laude lang ako. Ngayon, nag-aambu na ng mga magna and suma cum laude. And I'm saying, okay, where are all these geniuses, geniuses doing? No, What are they doing? At the very least, they should be teaching. <laughs> you know, it, it's ironic at an era where we have a, a record high number of suma cum laudes, bagsak naman yung education sector. So something's fishy there. No? Parang, hmm, okay. Anyway, sige. Probably not the topic. But it could be part of the topic. Yeah. Okay. But, um, yeah. You know, man, my, uh, my a little bit of take on that doc is I think really the the norm is quite problematic, but the approach is to fix that the system, mm. not to hate it. Because if we <laughs> if we just hate it, uh, nothing will will really happen. Yeah. Uh, I think um, there's a way to somehow contribute to fix the system. I think one way that we can contribute, yung mga kagaya natin na medyo nakalusot on an exceptional path, mm-hmm. is we should somehow tell them na hindi nyo dapat sundan yung exceptional path, but we should really help one another to fix yung system. Kasi yun, nandun ang lahat, nandun ang marami. Uh, ang reasoning ko dyan is, yung kasing mga nakakalusot sa exceptional path is talagang medyo, ano yan eh, um... Uh, medyo pag ganun lahat ang dinaanan natin baka traumatizing <laughs> actually there's a point eh, and sometimes this keep me, keeps me up at night it's a fine line between genius and madness no? one man's genius another man's madness so the only difference siguro lang was the lack of the draw minsan no? this person is a genius kasi nakalusot if he had not gone through it Ah, si Raul pala siya. <laughs> ano ba yun? <laughs> Ayun yung problema. Kasi the, 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 the language is similar. People are passionate on both sides. But then one is a cook and the other one is a yeah. is a visionary. And then the, 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 the ones in between, actually that's also a problem. If you're also in just in between. Uh, I guess ang, maybe the dividing line na lang will be quality of life. How, how well does it contribute to your well-being? But yep. we've seen in history a lot of the more innovative. Like I saw the movie Oppenheimer just recently. He had a very troubled life. <laughs> yeah, political, <laughs> personal, 
emotional love life niya was a mess and this is the guy that ushered in the nuclear age you know? so i don't know uh, it's it's an interesting you know well hopefully hindi naman tayo nandun not yet <laughs> okay yeah, sige and, um, so you got in oh, ano na nangyari once you got in sa SGS so the the no na join ako sa SGS so very interestingly of course yun nga um pabibo uh, narinig ko yung yung bagong manager sabi niya anybody who want to be promoted should wear yellow uh figure of speech <laughs> sabi ko gusto ko ma-promote kasi syempre yung starting salary mo uh, though mas mataas kaysa ino-offer ng karamihan sa labas is of course uh, pag nagtatrabaho ko sa Makati is parang ano rin, parang minimum wage. So, kasi expensive pumunta sa Makati, lahat ng bibilin mo doon is medyo mas mahal ng konti uh, compared to other places. And um, of course, you are starting to raise family. Gusto mo ma-promote para tumas yung salary mo. So, ganun talaga. Masigasig, uh, masikap. And then, um, you really work hard. Yun yung time na, sabi ko, yun yung time na narinig ko nga minsan yung uh, may nagsabi na politician na working 16 hours a day. That's true. Nung time na yun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even more. Uh, sometimes Saturday, Sunday, pupunta ka sa office kasi survival mode eh. Uh, bagong, nag-umpisa nun ang BPO na lumago sa Philippines and you need to prove yourself. Uh, talagang uh, patunayan mo sa mga ibang location na mas magagawa mo ng maganda yung trabaho. At yun yung naging way siguro Kaya Saka yung may motivation talaga ako nun Which is the family Kaya talagang gagawin mong lahat para To to somehow be successful On what the organization is um, asking you to do Yeah So which brings me to I guess you found your love for change management in SGS ba? Or even before that? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think that's something that we've been talking about a lot, no? Offline. Yep. So, nag-start yung passion ko sa change management nung, I think, that's way back uh, nung nagpalit kami ng system from, di ba? <laughs> During those times, is AS400. Tapos, yung mga, may mga dub terminals pa, no? Na nakakonect na nakakonect lang kayo sa isang server sa office. Pero you cannot do anything dun sa sa terminal mo kundi to, to encode everything. AS400, tapos in-introduce yung meron kaming Lotus Notes noon. Tapos pinalitan ng Microsoft. Lotus oh. Notes. <laughs> yeah, I remember yeah. that. <laughs> That's IBM, di ba? Uh, Lotus Notes. Pinalitan ng Microsoft Office. Uh, nang... Dun ko nakita kung ano yung difficulty na yung pagpalit ng system pagpalit ng technology, minsan na nasasagasayan is yung lahat ng pinaghirapan mo. <laughs> Kaya ka magre-resist. Dahil um, using the old system, of course, using your creativity para to make your job a lot easier is you are doing the macro recording sa AS400, na i-automate mo yung mga paglalagay ng units para hindi mo na itatype each time. Tapos biglang papasok ibang system. Totally, yung pinaghirapan mong i-program na automated na before, papalitan na naman ng bago. So, yun yung nakita ko na reason kung bakit nagre-resist yung mga end users. And pag medyo abrupt yung change, sa halip na mamotivate ka dahil mas maganda yung bagong technology, ang nararamdaman mo, nakapokus ka dun sa pain na nangyari sa'yo. <laughs> At ang masama pa dun is pag hindi siya nare-recognize, Uh, which I think boils down into the root cause na dapat medyo kailangan i-recognize mo muna na yung mga mangyayaring uh, medyo mahirap para naman hindi feeling mo as an end user is parang binaliwala. So nandun ang galing yung passion ko for change management. And then nung another new system is to be introduced, sabi ko, uh, and it's been introduced to my team. Uh, kami yung magiging pilot by the time. And uh, nakita ko, nag nag umikot yung business analyst, nag-interview siya ng mga users. Pero nung in-interview niya ako, parang maganda naman yung mga question niya. Pero hindi siya masyado nakikinig dun sa mga sagot ko. <laughs> Medyo disappointing. Sabi ko, 
kasi gusto kong ipaliwanag talaga what we are currently doing para makonsider dun sa pag-design ng bagong system. Uh, di, di, anong nangyari ganun? Pero anong naging resulta nung i-deploy na yung system nung tinetest na namin? So ang daming ang hindi po pwede talaga. Hindi mo talaga matatanggap kasi magbabagsak yung productivity dahil medyo may gap dun sa design. Coming from a client-based application sa web-based application. Pumapatok na kasi nun yung, ano eh, yung web-based application. Uh, pero you are doing a lot of things offline na talagang sasagasaan lahat yun where you are very efficient and gagawin mong online with, <laughs> yung time na yun, ang connectivity pa is medyo hindi talaga ganun pakabilis. It's a... Uh, yun yung time na maswerte ka na pagka meron kang 100 kbps na, <laughs> na bandwidth. So, uh, kaya panay ang reklamo ko nun. Kaya siguro naisip ni na Ma'am Rosario dahil sa Leon is uh, puro reklamo. Isama na lang natin sa project. <laughs> Since you're the biggest critic, you might as well be part of the solution. No? Parang ganun. Yes, yes. And then, yun naman, sabi ko, ah, pag pala problema ka, tapos nabigyan ka ng opportunity to be part of the solution, you should make the most out of it. And uh, making the most out of it, it means na kailangan talagang Uh, basahin mo yung lahat ng mga kailangan mong basahin and it's a lot kasi you need to read all the contract instructions you need to read all the procedures you really need to understand para makakapag uh, participate ka sa project na meron, ang, meron ka talaga madadalang value na um, hindi perfect kasi <laughs> may mga times din na yung mga inputs ko ay mag, mm, bigla mong ma-realize ah mali pala then babawiin mo titingnan ka ng masama ng developer so I sabi mo ganito kahapon, bakit ngayon babagoyin mo? Eh, wala tayong magagawa. Some real say, you know, it's better to correct it now than later. Uh, mapahiya na tayo ngayon kaysa naman sa mapahiya tayo kung kailan medyo expensive na siyang gawin. So, ganun na nangyari. Naging tester ako. Tapos, uh, from um, ang position ko na na-supervisor, na-demote ako to being help desk <laughs> ng bagong system na i-deploy. Pero um, naging, hindi naman ako masyadong nadidisappoint kasi nagustuhan ko na yung ginagawa ko. Kasi doing the analysis, doing the help desk work, being able to answer a lot of questions, that, that, that excites me pagka may napipix na issues. And uh, yung tanong mo about change management, dun ko pa rin nasasabi na ang kailangan lang talaga dito is... Um, kailangan talagang merong sistema yung change management na nandun sa foundation of everything that you're trying to do. Because if it's that taken good care of right from the beginning, I think less yung cost ng implementing new system. Uh, of, uh, less yung magiging resistance ng, ng end users. It will never be perfect. Pero parang exponentially you will be able to improve your chance for success. Kasi nandun talaga lahat ang informasyon na kailangan mo uh, along the way hanggang sa maging successful yung bagong system na in-introduce. You know, ano, if I can interject here, no? kasi um, although I've never in a way formally used the term change management, I have I have a feeling it's it's something we've been doing for for some time. Kasi any, anytime you want to innovate, come up with something new, it implies change management. Parang for me, it's always the last box eh, in any workflow. Okay, you develop something, you test it, you roll it out, you do a UAT, whatever, put it in production. And then, palagi kami meron last box, change management. And for me, it always just implied, and I'm probably mistaken, parang a way of institutionalizing a new process, whether it's a combination of training and uh, process change and whatever. So anyway, the, the question I wanted to ask is, that's obviously the core of what you're implying. How did you come by parang the, the concept of it? Is it something you can formally study? Or did you pick it up organically? Or are there tools? Or are there ano, parang references that you had to consult? Did you know it was change management from the get-go or then later mo na lang na-define? How did it happen? 
Ah, no. Um, right from the beginning, na hindi ko pa nga alam yung label na change management. <laughs> no, no. Because from operations, na nagre-resist ako dun sa mga changes na ako yung nagre-resist. Kasi tingin ko is hindi na consider yung mga talagang kailangan i-consider ng mga requirements. Into being part of the project team, doing the testing, and then eventually becoming the the help desk and doing a lot of business analysis in between. Uh, so wala pa yung label na change management. So ang change management na nananunig ko is uh, all about creating the training materials and about uh, communication. Um, Na-realize ko yung la label na change management nung uh, yung manager ko naman, nung inoperate na namin yung global application help desk, he asked me to uh, take the uh, ITIL certification. And then part nun is of course part na nung process sa ITIL certification is change management. Na-introduce na yung concept doon ng change management. Pero, doon ko napag-isipan, sabi ko, change management is, kagaya nga sabi mo, Doc, parang part naman siya ng lahat ng klase ng ginagawa natin. Hindi, hindi na parang ang feeling mo is pinoformalize lang siya as another distinct discipline. But it's, so, it's actually embedded on everything that we do uh, all throughout the Uh, processes and uh, dun sa uh, all throughout from uh, inception ng project hanggang sa may implement mo siya at may close. Um, so parang redundant na na you have another uh, discipline to be put in place na change management. Pero sabi ko, dahil ang kahirapan sa change management nga is nung tangible pa yung mga changes, halimbawa, ang papalitan is machinery. Outright, alam mo na kung paano yung ma-manage yung change. Kasi nakikita mo eh kung ano yung pinapalitan. Alam mo, ang pinalitan is from typewriter, pinalitan na siya ng computer. Hindi ka naman siguro masyadong magkikling na ayaw ko ng computer, gusto ko is typewriter. Kasi obvious na mahirap mang gamitin ng computer dahil you, you lack skills. You need to manage that change and you are willing to do that. Pero pagdating na sa mga, ang papalitan na is mga software, bagong application, kung mag blurry na yung lines, alin ba yung acceptable, alin yung pinapalitan lang due to preference, alin yung pinapalitan lang dahil it looks better, alin yung pinapalitan lang dahil it's it's um, because of cost consideration, na na-overlook na yung transition pagdating dun sa, sa end users. Kaya ngayon, nung ang nangyayari ng mga changes is parang hindi na siya masyadong tangible, I think the more that the the change management discipline becomes uh, more re uh, relevant. And I'm um, na-realize na ko diyan, I think that's from 2010 nung nagkaroon ako ng six months tenure uh, dedicated as business analyst. Doon ko na-realize na pag kahit kano gaganda yung pag-analyze mo, kahit gaano kaganda yung bagong solution compared to the old one, pag binigla mo yan, ang pag-introduce, at hindi mo uh, ipiniliwanag muna, hindi mo in-involve yung mga taong gagamit ng bago mong solution, <laughs> um, malamang magre-resist talaga sila. Kahit pa 100% sure ka na, it's a much better solution, much more efficient, much more convenient for them. Kasi yung muscle memory nila, uh, from the old ways of doing it, saka yung, yun nga, yung may mga solution nila na attached to it, na hindi ka naman na tingin nila is mas maganda kaysa dun sa bago mong in-introduce, napakahirap i-overcome pag hindi mo minanage sa kanila ahead of time. So, gradually... You, ano, you, you, I mean, just on that point, no? Kasi I've always believed that any innovation, even techno technological innovation, is ultimately a people innovation. No? It's a change in people, change in persons. Kaya nga, If I go the negative route, yung, I, I love quoting yung McKinsey statistic of failed di digital transformations. 70%, 7-0. That's, that's almost a guaranteed failure if you do something like that. No? And they cite na the, the, the highest risks are always people risks. So that seems to parang go hand in hand with what you're saying. No? You have to be careful how you introduce the change. Again, again, again. Even though the change is logical, it's based on data, it's based on every 
argument you can think of it's profitable pero for some reason hindi naman yata yun yung driving factor for successful change marami mga successful changes are very abrupt very you know sometimes uh many times subconscious or unconscious like the decision to adopt video conferencing because of the pandemic kung hindi ka na tinutukan ng baril sa ulo na okay you're gonna get you're gonna die if you go out back to your office because of covid whether you, you know that was uh, factual or not parang the world suddenly shifted that's digital transformation boom no everyone shifted pero it's hardly kind of what we think of successful transformations na yeah, very gradual very whatever so i don't know what's your take on that no how what what are the what's yeah. the crucial component i think that's that's very telling observation doc yung sinabi mo na ang successful changes is minsan is yung abrupt that you are you didn't actually did uh, this so called change management before it. pero ilan lang yun ilan lang yung <laughs> po pwedeng magkaroon ma-meet yung condition na yun na you have no choice because the, the biggest problem of a lot of projects is the dilemma of choice yung decisiveness uh, sa design pa lang is napakarami ng option na pwede mong tingnan, napakarami ng pwedeng puntahan ng design decision sa bawat iteration ng mga application or software projects and um, sometimes we naturally pagka ikaw yung nasa technical side you go to the easiest route possible technically <laughs> but sometimes the, the easiest route technically is not the ones that will really fit the real requirements on the ground and then you will it will be a back and forth of a lot of things na pag na-realize mo na ah, hindi talaga pala siya tatanggapin kasi they have a, they still have the choice and you are correct that if if the situation comes to that point na ang gagawin mo is uh you talk to the CEO and you tell the CEO tell everybody they don't have a choice so that they will use this and yeah in, course, in many cases it's an um it's political isn't it parang kung hindi yan sinuporta ni whoever kaya nga ano, one of the last things i learned before i left corporate because i had to leave corporate at that point <laughs> was um you have to find a sponsor for whatever you want to do and I, I had that reinforced again when I was an IT vendor. I be, I briefly became a vendor also. I worked in a an IT firm. And it's not a life I would wish on everyone, but it was certainly educational for me. Because it's one thing to be instigating change from within. It's another thing to be instigating change from outside, basically selling it to the recipient of the change. And sometimes there are cases when it's easier to be outside. Because at least you're met at face value by your client, alam nila you're there with an agenda and alam nila you're there with a price tag. And if it suits their agenda to, to serve your agenda and if they can afford it, then you have poss possibly a sale. Di pa guarantee yun. Possibly. Uh, but from within, ang hirap. Kasi by default, do you have a hierarchy? Tao ka lang eh. But ka, how come you, Leon, has the, all the ideas? You're not the CEO. Marang ganun, di ba? So, in a way, you need a sponsor who is at a certain level who can, you know, who can champion your cause. Actually, you know where I also learned uh, this was when I briefly became, and a lot of people don't know this, I briefly moonlighted as a real estate broker. <laughs> uh, I was working with my mother and we were selling condos. No, This was uh, early to, early pa to, in the, in the mid-2000s for me at least. No? I was actually... Uh, I was working in banking, but this was my sideline. So, sanay ako dyan sa, you go tripping, you show the property to the customer, you, you know, you try to wow them with the model unit, and then you have the payment schedule, which worked hand-in-hand hand with me because I had a finance background. I know how loans work, so I would also, in a way, guide them through the loan application process, which uh, which was actually really masalimuot sa totoo lang. No? Most people don't like the idea of borrowing money. But we're talking here about a big ticket purchase, eh? you know, buy a house. And then anyway, I was I remember buying a book, forgot who, parang the art of selling. Kasi sabi ko, you know, I, I'm not really a born salesman. Okay? Uh, I, I don't know how this thing works. And uh, I didn't know kung sino nagsulat, Tom Peters yata or something. Basta one of the sales gurus. And binabasa ko, and sabi niya, you, sabi niya the three 
there's always three elements in the sale. No? And you can overcomplicate and bloat it. But you're always, always gunning for three things, sabi niya. First is, do they need it? <laughs> Doon pa lang, bokya na marami. Eh. Parang, there are so many changes that are being forced upon you, pero hindi mo naman kailangan. So it, that talks to your point about abruptness. It's abrupt pag kailangan mo na talaga, whatever happens, you're gonna do it. Second, can they afford it? Okay? Usually, that's the main objection. Pero sabi niya, that's actually the easiest objection to overcome, the money par, uh, problem. Provided they really need it. Mag madaling gawa ng payment, ano yan, arrangement. But the last is always where most salespeople fail, sabi niya. And it's, are you talking to the decision maker? And this is on a micro level. Like, kunyari, you're selling a house, kausap mo yung guy, and sabi niya, tanungin ko muna yung asawa ko. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, it's either a, a, a creative deflection o hindi talaga siya yung decision maker. Or tanungin ko muna yung parents ko. And then you as a salesperson, if you've already qualified the first two, na mukhang kaya nila to, mukhang kailangan talaga nila to, it's just a, a matter of finding that decision maker. And na kinakwento sa amin nung, kasi syempre, you get a sales coach trying to mark, parang insurance din yan, trying to marshal all the agents to bag their first sale. If you find the first two, thir yung third na lang ang kailangan, you should not rest until you find that decision maker. Yung iba pa nga, super talagang hard sell. No? Ah, saan po yung asawa niyo, ma'am? Ah, sir. Ah, nasa office. Puntahan na po natin siya ngayon para makausap na natin. Kasi sayang po, you're mag expire po yung presyo na to. Next week, tataas siya ng 10%. Alam mo, yung mga tactics, di ba? And, syempre, they'll, they'll be defensive, they'll back off, and usually, it, the sale fails because you you didn't pre-qualify. Baka hindi naman pala nila kailangan. So your insistence will be seen as moronic and, ano, and adversarial. Pero kung kailangan nila, baka naman wa wake. You know? They don't they don't can't really afford it. So you kind of learn to assess someone based on some indicators. You know? What car do they drive? How do they dress? What are their shoes? Ano yun? Or look them up in the... Dati, wala pang LinkedIn. No? Uh, look them up in social media see where they live. In a way, you have all of these parang materialistic indicators. And you know a person, in a way, you develop an instinct there when a person walks in the showroom if this person's gonna buy. A lot of the sales that we saw happened in a split second. Pumasok lang, they liked it, pirma agad. Yung mga tumatagal, dami mga sat-sat, unfortunately, are really, you know, not there to buy, you know. But syempre, the desperate ones, they'll go after the ones who... Actually, there's a phenomenon nga as known as ano eh, people who love talking to salesmen. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, you're familiar with this. They just love to entertain and be entertained, get coffee. Yung pala, they're like freeloading lang pala on the premises. It's really hard. Huh? It's really hard, uh, hard life. But I learned that. I learned that. I actually managed to sell one condo. <laughs> you know, uh, dyan sa Mandaluyong. And that was the sum totality of my real estate career. Later, I went into some real estate development, which was also a trauma. You know, we had a piece of property in Quezon City. I partnered with a, an architect and a, and a contractor. Oh my God. I, you know, kaya nga, nung namatay yung father ko, yun yung heartbreak ko eh. I never made it up to my father. No? Actually, ano niya yun eh, family inheritance niya yun. Talo kami dun, lugi kami dun. It, it was never resolved. Kumbaga, yung partners ko ran away with it. But that was also a reminder na you gotta know what you're doing. There's no excuse for ignorance. And anyway, decades in the future, we're talking about yeah, change management, digital transformation. Uh, and you're talking about yeah, guiding people through the change. I think that's the storytelling part. Eh. It's the leadership. That's the political will. Pero there's no substitute also for actual know-how. And those two go together. Marami naman, maraming alam. They're experts. They're data people. No, they're uh, data scientists. No, they're innovators. Pero walang political will na kaakibat. It also fails. So there's this very very slim, parang overlap. No, I like that diagram. I used to draw that in my slides where you have the political will and you have the technical know-how. The intersection is your probability of success for any transformation. Uh, but I call it transformation. In your case. Uh, that's probably one of the essential elements of a change management strategy. No? Anyways, again, I'm talking too much. <laughs> so back to you. What do you think of that? Or yeah, no, uh, but uh, I'm enjoying listening to you because um those uh, are making sense. Una -una yung point mo nga na, uh, pwede naman na walang change change management, and then if it's really like um a gun in your head that you have to do it, 
Wala kang choice. <laughs> Then, but that's actually change management, Doc. Mm-hmm. Uh, you come to think of it. But those things, um, you need to recognize the elements that are in play. If the political will is there, if the feasibility of the solution is there, and if the need is there, pag nagsama-sama yung tatlong yun, you have no choice. <laughs> you have to do it now. And that's change management. You just need make, to make sure that you have all the necessary element to implement the change. And But that type of change management has a corresponding price tag behind it. Mm-hmm. And it can be huge beyond the cost of implementing the project. Because the price tag behind it, pagka ganun na ang sitwasyon, na it, it, it has to happen no matter what, then you need to pay for the consequences. And sometimes the consequences is not just the cost of the new solution and uh, or the cost of the old solution that's going to be replaced. It's the motivation of your people. It's the uh, productivity. It's the sustainability of the business that you have, will have to consider uh, the rather. <laughs> and if you have no choice, then you will say, okay, we'll deal with that later. But then, of course, that's the cost that comes with it. And um, change management is is so complex. That's why uh, uh, hindi ko naman itinatanggi yung doc na it's really a hard sell. Pag talaga ay try mo bent on change management by itself, you will not be, uh, we will not be able to sell it. That's why uh, kailangan mong humanap ng entry point to get in there and then you operate change management when you are in there and when you are able to talk, yun nga, sinasabi mo na sa who holds the power in terms of making those decisions. And uh, I've learned that from Prosci, um, yung inintroduce nila yung triangle ng sponsorship, ng change management, at saka ng project management. I think that's a very powerful uh, triangle. But it's so complex to operate. Kasi uh, iba yung interest ng project management, iba yung interest ng sponsorship, And then, of course, change management is something that is tend, pagka hindi siya na, nagawa ng maganda, at pagka hindi mo na, naintindihan yung complexities behind what is being implemented, yung uh, power structure behind it, why it's being implemented in the first place, you can actually make it even more costly by trying to do change management, <laughs> or you can derail the project by trying to do change management. That's why you always have to find that sweet spot somewhere that you can serve the different biases in a way that hindi masasacrifice yung true objective behind why you're actually implementing the change. And, you know, uh, that reminds me. Uh, can I just bring it up? Kasi, yes, of course. Kasi this also hits me pala a different way. No? Because as you know, one of the biggest things I'm doing now is AI. No? Trying to evangelize and teach people how to utilize gen ai at a personal level not necessarily b2b although the b2b pops up unfortunately uh, or fortunately rather from time to time no pero you know the classic project management triangle diba uh, cost time and ano isa quality no but you can only choose two parang ganun yan diba if you want it fast and cheap it probably sucks <laughs> Or if you if you want it high quality and fast, it's probably expensive. Or if you want it, uh, I know, high quality, uh, and cheap, it's probably gonna take forever. Parang ganon. You can only choose two. Now, of course, I'm not trying to hard sell it, but I think Gen AI is one of those few technologies that if you play it right, you can short circuit that triangle. It can be fast, it can be cheap, and the quality can be good. And that's why when I talk to people about it, lalo na mga B2B, they don't, either they don't understand it or they don't believe it. Kasi they're wired na to respect the triangle. Eh. Nasunog na kasi sila before. Na parang talaga, it can be that cheap. Sabi ko, the only cost you need to bear is the internet connectivity and you can log on to these chatbots. Kaya nga when I say, but you have to fix the privacy. Ayun, yun, there's always a cost. Yeah, but yes and no. You know, it depends on you. No? If How private do you really want to be? If you're, talking about these random reports that you're processing, of course, barring any NDAs that you've signed, there really is very, very little risk. Um, kaya nagets yan eh. And then yung, pa, yung pala, second segue, may come back, let's come back to the first point. Unfortunately, if you're dealing with technologies like AI or data, eh, data anything, these are most, these are usually disruptive technologies. Kasi nga, 
by default, most companies start quite analog, quite uh, ano ba? driven by intuition, driven by gut feel. So data is just an unfortunate uh, output no? or outcome of their decisions. Kumbaga parang produce your financial statements. That's it. Pero what, what people try to advocate, and I used to do that a lot, is you make data the centerpiece. It will drive decision making. Or even in the most extreme case, it becomes your product. Data is the product. Data is the service. Diba? Kasi sa karamihan, there's a primary service. Maybe we're offering, I don't know, um, food. No? You're selling food or you're selling uh, car parts or you're selling a spa. No? Yun yung primary service. And then data is second fiddle. We'll support that via whatever, marketing, operations, ganyan. Pero talaga yung ultimate products are the ones that are made of data itself. Like, you know, Waze is a data product. Google is a data product. Facebook is a data product. It's all about data first. Anyway, all I'm trying to say is, it's always implied na pag disruption, kailangan may change management. Di ba? Uh, kaya naalala ko no, when I was in vendor land, um, kasi vendors sell many things. Yung mga data analytics, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning na seller, they're usually stressed, more stressed out kasi you know, you're advocating change. So in, in a way, it, it trains you to think differently kasi you need to find an entry point, you need to disrupt the thinking, change the way they're doing it, which is com compared to your companions, kunyari sa IBM, people who sell rather mundane stuff like tape backup <laughs> or uh, or servers or even laptops. No, There's nothing disruptive about laptops anymore. You're basically a supplier na lang of day-to-day -day BAU. Sila yung nakakakota. That those are those are positions to be to be desired. Because your 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 sales quota is literally just, or your sales bonus is literally just dependent on the number of hours you're awake in the day, Because the more people you meet, the more people who buy the laptops, the higher your commission. Wala na silang, there's no need to evangelize people as to the virtues of having laptops in your office. No, It's more about, oh, sir, yung mga sinuplay namin last time, 100 pieces, nag-expire na yan, wala nang support, let's upgrade them na. Or how many of them are actually defective already? We have to upgrade. So there's a natural refresh cycle. So talagang business as usual, cash flow sila. And these are the salespeople who make their numbers and are driving their BMWs eventually. Yung mga nasa fringe, yung mga visionary type, who are trying to evangelize the use of natural language processing, automation, you're running against ano eh, the, the, the grain. Eh, no? It's anti-BAU. In fact, you're supposed to disrupt BAU para maging ma-adopt nila technology. And that's where the failure rate is quite high. No? Yung mga McKinsey stats. Kaya yung mga nakaka-score dyan, and I've scored a couple of sales myself no, in my career. Parang condo lang eh. It's all no usually a one off. Once you have one, tapos na yon. You move on to another client. You try to disrupt their thinking. So in a way, I'm a victim or I'm a product of my my training. Then, parang it's always disruptive. Ngayon, I wanna flip it around. Can we make AI business as usual na part of day to day? Parang Microsoft Excel. No? I love that. No una disruptive pa yan. Ngayon, parang you wouldn't think twice about having Excel in your computer. In fact, you need it. Uh, siguro the difference na lang will be do you have it in the cloud or do you have it locally? That's more of a minor issue or licensing issue na lang yan, uh, connectivity issue. Um, can can Gen AI be that? And I I suspect it's a, it's a change management question. Parang yun pakiramdam ko. Kasi again, when people hear about things like AI, parang the thing, it's something radical, revolutionary, ganyan, ganyan. Sabi ko, did you think email was radical and revolutionary back in the day? Actually, it was, no? Ako ko, naalala mo nun. Parang, do you have an email address? I don't yeah. know yet if I need one. Eh, parang ganun yung reply, di ba? Parang hindi ko pa yata kailangan. I'm, I'm happy with fax. <laughs> or I'm happy with snail mail. Ngayon, if you say fax machine, what era are you living under, Leon? Na nagpa-fax machine ka pa. Alala ko na yung mga thermal paper ek ek yan. Yep. Tapos mab mabubura after a while. That was major, no? Back in the day. Can you fax it to me? Imagine mo. Ngayon, email na. Attach it. And then before you know it, AI na will write it for you. It's very, very different, no? Uh, anyway, I don't know. Mga, mga anecdotes, no? That uh, that were triggered by your sharing. <laughs> yeah, but connecting to that book, uh, kailangan natin, syempre, 
clearly first thing is kailangan talaga nating i-qualify yung AI at saka yung Gen AI. Yeah. Kasi AI has been with us for quite a long time. Medyo uh, consciously or unconsciously it's been with us. Sa may matagal na naman na yung mga chatbot, di ba? And yung machine learning has been there for quite some time and then a lot of automation has been implemented somehow belonging to that uh, broader uh, category of artificial intelligence. But generative AI is a little bit distinct. Uh, kasi yan yung in-introduce sa atin ay the machines that can now talk back to us. And instead of uh, searching, you are now asking questions. Uh, parang nare-rewire yung brain natin into I'm looking for something Now it's getting rewarded into I'm asking for something. I'm asking a question and then the answers that I'm going to get is going to suggest me what I'm supposed to buy or what I'm supposed to do or what I'm supposed to know or what I'm supposed to learn. Uh, so medyo may pagbabago. And I think it will be self-sustaining or as na mag-start uh, to anybody. Kasi ang first step dyan is... Um, pag nag-adapt tayo sa generative AI is uh, yun na rin yung magtuturo sa atin kung anong kailangan natin gawin. Because uh, we can use generative AI to know the things, to lead us into the things that we need to do. Because it's telling us a lot of things. It can tell us a lot of things. And um, uh, ang problema nga lang dyan is um, yung worry ng anong gagawin yan dun sa dating norm and how we can make the transition from that norm to the new norm that will be totally different <laughs> uh, from what it is today on what it will be in the future. And um, yun yung sinasabi ko na, ang na -experience, base dun sa experience ko sa, din sa from AS400 to uh, client applications, uh, then to web applications. Uh, hindi minsan... Uh, ang problema is kung ano yung in-introduce na application. Minsan, ang problema ay nanggagaling dun sa tama ba yung pagka-design at tama ba yung sequencing ng pagkaka-implement at nandun ba yung mga element, elements na somehow will tell everybody we really have to do it now. Uh, we really have to do it. Kasi ang balik na naman dun sa punto na hanggat meron kang choice, your choice is to remain where you are. Uh, to the usual thing that you do things kasi nandun yung comfort zone at nandun yung confidence mo. At uh, paano kang pupunta sa isa sa into the future na hindi ka masyadong confident. Uh, may mga nagsasabi nga na hindi sila mga bobong tao kundi matatalinong tao sila. They are intellectuals and what they are saying is it's going to destroy us. It's going to <laughs> it's going to cause uh, societal uh, collapse. Eh, paano ka namang hindi mag-worry kung matatalinong tao ang magsasabi sa'yo ng ganyan? Uh, kaya nandun yung, nandun you know, yung I dilemma. I don't know if you've heard of the Pessimists Archive. No? You should check it out. It's a it's a website that compiled basically historical clippings of how we were negative about their technologies in the past. For example, uh, anything. You know, teddy bears, bicycles, cars, even books. Uh, we wanted to burn them, no? Parang ganun. And there was always this undercurrent. Most of the the clippings are obviously in the 19th century, because dun naman na usa na yung the first information technologies, no? Which is the printing press. Um, uh, dun nagsimula yung mass production of news, uh, etc. No? Pero in a way, it reflects up until that point this love hate relationship with anything that's automated anything that replaces human labor anything that replaces human industry na siguro back in the middle ages was probably considered heretical or or a work of the devil or whatever like for example i'm always fascinated and i'm not an expert on this subject so i could be misquoting how the islamic world which was the center of innovation once upon a time in the old in the old era kaya nga Terms like algebra, that's that's an Arabic term, no? And a lot of astronomical bodies, Sirius, Betelgeuse, yung mga names ng stars, are actually Arabic. 
Kasi back in the day, the the leading thinkers in science and mathematics were it was in the Muslim world, no? And then I remember you can Google this. Eh, parang there was a certain period where parang mathematics was outlawed or it was considered heretical, I think. Ah. And then nag collapse yung civilization na uh, in terms of innovation, naging naging superstitious pigla. I'm not uh, casting aspersions on religion at all, no. Pero that was a major loss. And then na pick up na lang siya nung nagkaroon ng Renaissance, the Western world naman yung suddenly naging pinakel. Kasi there was also a period where the church supported, started supporting uh, science, no. Some of the first benefactors of Yan si Leonardo da Vinci and all these people were were the church. And then later nagkaroon ng love-hate relationship, no. Parang science became anti-religion, no. Art also became anti-religion. And then yan yung interplay na suddenly yung yung progress ng civilization changed uh, after that. Ngayon we think of kunyari AI technologies very western, very hegemonic. Cent- the, pa- the center of power is California. Pero that doesn't necessarily need to be the, the case, diba? Kaya I'm always, and I'm gonna jump to a totally different angle, which is, we we happen to live in the Philippines. I'm always curious what the Philippines' role is in this new, parang ano, in this new age. Our BPO industry is a reflection of that. For some reason, we became one of those centers of innovation. Second to India, obviously. Pero Philippines talaga. And it's not just contact centers, it's back office, it's everything. But yet, tayo as a country, we have yet to embrace BPOs in general, huh? just sentiment-wise, as something we're really good at. In in many cases, yeah, we think of it as kind of a kind of an offshoot lang eh, or an aberration na parang, yeah, it's good, but it's not something we want to be proud of. You know, I'm hinting here at kind of a stigma. You know, uh, and then we're back to that original point about education. I feel all of these are change management questions, diba? Parang you don't want to double down on what's working. You want to insist on something that hasn't been proven. My pros and cons, naman pareho. And then the story. A lot of it depends on the story that you that you weave, that you convince people on. So I, I, it's already getting overwhelming at this point in my head. Parang wow, how do you manage all of that? Kaya back to you. How did you manage it, or how do you propose to manage it? Yes, Doc. Um, I'm just I just want to pick on that point about the BPO and the new opportunity for the Philippines. Because I naalala ko rin nung introduce ang BPO. Ang tawag pa nun is call centers. Yeah. And ang reaction initial reaction ko is call centers. Pa nung sa sabi nila ito yung sunshine industry oh. by the time 2000s, 2001, 2002, 2003. Sunshine industry yung call centers. Wala pa yung term na BPO. Eh. Wala pa yung term na ITBPM or anything like that. Um, and I'm thinking, soon it will be obsolete kasi tingin ko ang telepono, yung traditional phone that they are, you're going to pick up the phone and you're going to call someone will be obsolete. And uh, But then it turned out na we are able to uh, make that uh, normal adjustments in terms of technology na naging hindi na siya uh, strictly calling you by a phone. Uh, now it becomes a smartphone. It becomes all these apps that uh, people are trying to contact us. And then we are able to process the information and then we are able to serve the needs uh, via the BPO. And then now with the introduction of, uh, of um, generative AI, so then how we are going to position ourselves uh, here. Um, yung industry and then the country as a whole kasi malaking parte ng economy natin ngayon ang um, BPO I think we really have to be uh, that's why I'm seeing the opportunity uh, na kahit hard sell yung change management and that's why we are also pro- promoting pragmatic agility kasi iba talaga to uh, itong era na to na nag introduce natin yung uh, generative AI because the moment that you start using it is the moment that it will be self-sustaining so that you can go to the next step of adapting it. You just need to get your uh, self into it. But that the moment that you get yourself into it, you, you make 
uh, poor de- decision making. Yung sabi mo nga, pagka masyado kang nagmadali, uh, uh, at tapos i- gusto mo naman is eh, hindi ka masyadong magagastusan, malamang ang magsasapar is yung quality. And then, ang tendency pa nito is pagka hindi mo talaga alam yung ginagawa mo, is you tend, yung adoption mo is baka ang puntahan is mag-collapse. And then you need to redo everything. Kaya ang tingin ko, maraming magkakaproblema, kaya maraming mga ngailangan ng change management. And then, uh, we should be able to use yung concept ng pragmatic agility na pag nagkaroon ka na ng problema, then you need to think, you need to have your choices. And in your choices, you have to be pragmatically agile. Because otherwise, you can easily become obsolete or you can easily be wiped out uh, of the of the industry. Uh, dahil pag bigla tayong binulaga, hindi yan kagaya ng introduction ng electricity. Eh, na nakikita mo na kailangan mo nilang lang trabahuhin yung power lines and they need to build the generation system. AI can just come to you na, now here's the solution, here's what AI can do, and you have no choice but to use it now, and then you'll have to make the necessary adjustment because you have no choice but to use it. <laughs> pwede mangyari yun. <laughs> because pwede yung mangyari na it's happening at the background and then suddenly it just comes to us and then we need to make the necessary adjustment. And if that happens, that's going to be quite painful uh, for those people who will be initially will be displaced. Pero hindi naman ganun ka-pessimistic ang view ko dyan kahit pa magkaroon ng disruption, kahit pa magkaroon ng um sabihin na nating painful transition kasi I think we can quickly recover because you can leverage AI to recover quickly then <laughs> You just need to make those necessary adjustments. Kaya doon magkakaroon talaga, tingin ko, is magkakaroon ng business of change management. Na doon na magiging madali ng ibenta ang change management. Yun yung moment na inihintay ko. <laughs> Kaya nagta- sa ngayon is, kahit walang naniniwala or uh, walang masyado na convince eh, is uh, I'm not really um, giving up on it kasi tingin ko is darating yung point yung tinatawag nila ano bang tawag dun sa technologies inflection point sa, sa terminology na oh, or, uh, you will or suddenly pivot, realize pivot point ah, pivot <laughs> huh? parang pivot point yes yes um, I think that will come and then they will remember ah we have a lot of problems now how can we do it Let's try nga yung sinasabi na kailangan mo mag-implement na ng good foundational system for change management. And then maybe one company will call us on that. And then if you are successful, they will tell everybody. Yun yung paulit-ulit ko sinasabi sa'yo, Doc, di ba? I just need that one opportunity and they will tell everybody if it's if it worked for them. Yeah, I think uh, I think the, the popular phrase, naalala mo nung ginagawa pa lang yung BGC. I don't know if you remember this. And then, I have a commercial. Siya. Parang, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Siyempre, ang ganda. Pa- <laughs> Napaka-philosophical niya. <laughs> Tapos BGC. <laughs> but, which is just Makati 3.0. But anyway. Pero, I, I, but I remember that. Kasi, tama nga, no? Parang, timing is a big factor. Which, in a way, it's kind of a luck issue that you can know something very very well maybe you can craft a very good story but if it's not time for it then um, you have to wait you have yeah, to wait eh. oh, oh. but then nung kaya trend spotting is another art eh. parang, parang, ano ba? Oras na ba? Oras. or you can just test parang market lang yan test the market test the market test the market patay 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 this bigla boom no it goes viral uh like i remember before the pandemic Zoom was not a big deal. Zoom was struggling. You know, people hated it when you booked a teleconference. Parang, ano ba yan? Mag-meeting na lang tayo. You know? <laughs> and then suddenly, you know, forced to it. I think that's the best analogy. Nga. You're forced to it. Kasi it was life-threatening to meet. Napaka-abstract, di ba? Kasi once upon a time, who would have thought meeting face-to-face would actually kill you? But at least the, the impression was you could die. So, kaya nga, ano eh, I'm having gone through it. Hindi na ako ganun ka, ka skeptical minsan when I hear something that sounds so absurd based on the standards of today. And I thought a pandemic was absurd. 
even though you read about it, the Spanish flu, SARS, back in the day, marami yung mga pandemics noong unang panahon. Pero since you didn't go through it, or you, it was not vivid enough, you didn't care. And then ngayon, after the fact, it's very vivid. People are actually parang moved by it. To the point nga na work from home is a big deal. Dati work from home is a luxury. Ngayon, working in the office is a luxury. You know, HR people are learning the hard way na pag sinabi mong 100% to in the office, bahala ka sa buhay mo. <laughs> I'm going to find other work that I can do remotely. It is a viable option na for many people. And that's why offices are struggling to hire. Because it's not because the talent is there, isn't there. It's the talent is there, but they know that they can get better because it's been proven na. Lalo na with the traffic and, you know, the pollution. But kapalalabas, no? And I know there's a massive anti-work from home move now, primarily driven by the real estate sector, para ma-justify yung mga rents nila. Uh, uh, I don't know. Parang for me, it, it feels very superficial kung yun lang yung, ano, yung driver mo of uh, activity. And that's affecting BPOs also. Diba? Yung mga BPOs na... Yeah. That's why, more. dun ko sana, no? dun ko sana uh, nakikita na, if we just try to think well ahead in advance <laughs> and then you anticipate na uh, may hirapan yung real estate sector but then if you try to support the real estate sector and you send everybody working in the office ang barrier mo naman dyan is yung traffic jam and then everybody will complain again and then i- i- sa halip na mag-improve ang sitwasyon sa economy baka lalong bumagsak minsan you need to be able to simulate those things Because we can do that now with the advent of generative AI. But of course, nobody's going to believe us by just saying these things, even if it, we know that uh, it could have been done. After the fact, everybody's a genius, di ba? <laughs> Pag na, nangyari na. Di ba? Pag binabalikan natin yung pandemic, lahat ng nangyari nung pandemic time, everybody knows what could have been done better. But nung papasok pa lang tayo sa pandemic, nobody knows what to do. <laughs> Uh, you but, know, actually, but... that reminds me nga, um, kasi ngayon, we're, I think this is another thing we're, worth noting about generative AI. No? Generative AI is more action than than insight. That's why it throws a lot of people off. Because eh? we're used to the old AI, which is inciting. Diba? Machine learning, visualization, mm-hmm. data science, statistics. The whole point is to come up with some sort of a dashboard or a prediction or a visualization, which is still a step away from getting anything done. Kaya nga, one thing uh, companies struggle with, continues to struggle with, is the ROI from data analytics. Kasi up until that point, you just inflated cost. <laughs> you acquired software licenses, you hired these expensive data people. Cost, 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 cost. So kailan ka kikita from that, no? The only time you will make money from analytics is if you change something that you used to do or you start doing something that you didn't do or you stop doing something that you're doing. That's when your cost dynamics start to, your revenue and cost dynamics start to change. You become more productive, you produce more with less or you stop doing a wasteful activity or you start doing a profitable activity. Yun palang yung ROI. Now, sa generative AI, the nexus of power or the gravit- center of gravity is towards the action. You know? Produce content, analyze content, do variations, produce art, suggest strategies. These are not analytical in the traditional sense. No, There's not enough. Para kaya nga analysis paralysis was always the problem with the traditional analytics and data science. Eh? Parang napaparalyze tayo. Too many ideas, too many options. Pero si generative AI, forget that, focus on this. Kaya nakakatakot siya kasi suddenly the the agency has moved from the machine to the human. And I feel that that's a change that needs to man- be managed also. Parang suddenly the AI is in your face doing something, no? As opposed to just giving you something to think about. Yeah. Uh, but the way to do it can we can manage it is um, balikan muna natin yung mga uh, groundworks that uh, should have been done before para mag-work talaga yung uh, generative AI. And of course, uh, we both know na hindi mo talaga ma-implement ng maayos ang anumang automated system or auto- anumang autonomous system kung medyo hindi siya supported ng magandang foundational data. 
kasi pag corrupted yung data mo, then ang mapo-produce na output ng gano'n man kagandang system mo is medyo uh, hindi rin kagandahan or baka sa halip na maging counter productive pa. Kaya yung sinabi mo doc na okay, you did the data analytics pero how are you going to reap benefits from it? Ito na yun. You are going to reap the benefits of having good data by being able to implement now generative AI. But then the implication is then what are you going to do with the people who are uh, na pag naging ultra efficient yung system mo? Those people who are doing a lot of manual things, what they are going to do? Uh, paano mo naman sila ipoposition into the system? Kaya dyan naman papasok yung talagang layer by layer ng change management. Kasi if you just think about it inside um, a standalone organization, ang isipin mo lang is, okay, I, I need to make my work using generative AI a lot more efficient. I have good data. I have good system in place. And then I, I should, now, uh, should now be able to let go of my people. And I can operate uh, ultra efficient. Uh, maybe uh, my, my profitability will jump from 10% to let's say 40% or even higher <laughs> because of the cost savings. But then in the long term, pag nag-collapse yung adoption mo ng generative AI, kaya mo bang makarecover? Dahil it may collapse pagka hindi mo siya na-maintain ng... Tama, and then sa halip na mabuhay yung organization mo for 20 years, baka mabuhay lang yung organization mo for the next 3 years. Happy ka for the next 3 years having such excellent profitability, but then nothing after that. Because once you collapse, you cannot recover. Dahil pwede siyang maging biktima ng overall dynamics na pagka uh, ang nagawa mong napaka-efficient na company is manufacturing a consumer product tapos bumagsak naman yung economy sino ba naman bibili ng consumer product mo so hindi lang ikaw dapat ang, ang maging ultra-efficient kundi the, the, the whole uh, society around you should also be ultra-efficient kaya yung generative AI cannot be confined into uh, hindi mo pwede siyang i-confine thinking about it uh, sa sa loob lang ng organization mo, you need to connect it to a lot of other things that are going to happen around it. And you need, you need to be on time on it. And you need to be on top of it. And uh, dyan natin pwede to siguro talagang i-anticipate na kailangan talaga ang foundational system mo, ang connection mo to the outside world, outside your organization should be, <laughs> should be, should be uh, well in place. Kasi poor decisions can really cost a lot. It can make you profitable for the short term, but it can make you collapse <laughs> immediately after. <laughs> Yun yung mga kailangan pag-aralan ng mabuti ng mga nag adapt ng, ng generative AI. At yun talaga. Kaya naman siguro, kaya naman ang nangyayari ngayon, Doc, talaga is ang discussion sa generative AI is global. Uh, and it's, uh, it's happening government to government, institution to institution, uh, country to country, <laughs> and then within the organization, within the industries, kailangan talagang pag-usapang mabuti. Kaya I'm making a bet on it na yung kagaya ng service natin will be in demand along the way. Uh, and talagang kakailanganin siya. Dahil it's a totally different type of change that's going to be introduced to us. Yeah, I mean, uh, we barely scratched the surface, no? But anyway, just thinking uh, we're probably we're at the hour, past the hour, na nga. Yeah. Uh, and we can talk <laughs> forever <laughs> about <laughs> this, no? Yeah. But anyway, we gotta save something for the next episode. We gotta do many of these para ano Leon, no? Na dami natin pag pwedeng pag-usapan. So maybe just as a closer for now, can you give? some parting thoughts about Gen AI, about change management, and then something to look... What are you personally looking forward to in this rapidly evolving landscape? One thing that I'm really uh, looking forward to is kailangan talaga maging strategic yung adoption natin ng generative AI. And the first thing that we need to recognize at this point is hindi mo talaga siya po pwedeng i-resist kasi it will come no matter what. Kasi kailangan siya ng panahon. We need to be ultra efficient. We need to be ultra productive if we are going to serve our population. Because the alternative for that is, yung sinabi rin, di ba, may nagtanong sa generative AI, how we can solve the problems, yung problema ng society ngayon. 
uh, and ang solution ng generative AI is eliminate humans <laughs> and then <laughs> you solve all the problems. Uh, hindi naman yun ang solution, di ba? We cannot uh, deliberately um, do things um, dahil na siguro wala naman siguro ang gustong gawin yun. So we need to have new solutions that will certainly help us. And I think the new solution really is generative AI. But how can we make it work for us will require systematic adoption, strategic approach. And uh, we really need to be part of the whole uh, system that's going to make it work for us. Uh, we cannot do it stand alone as an organization. You can be quite selfish, of course. You are able to come up with a uh, system that's going to uh, improve your own efficiency as an organization, but you need to think long-term. Your viability into the future, kapag ka nagbago na yung environment, baka hindi mo rin magustuhan na kapag pinroject mo yung future mo into that. Uh, baka hindi rin natin gusto yun. Uh, yung magiging effect pagka lahat gumaya sa ginagawa mo as a selfish organization or a selfish uh, individual. And we really need to think uh, holistically. Uh, I think na pag um, uh, masyado tayo nagmadali, kagaya nung sinabi mo, I, am, I think uh, that's one thing that I really um, appreciate in this conversation of us is yung highlight mo sa tungkol sa triangle ng quality, time, and uh, cost. I think, tama ka. You can even short-circuit that with generative AI because generative AI is really so powerful. But do you like the long-term outcome of it? Are you going to be happy with that? Because most of the time, you will be able to short-circuit it in a very selfish way. Hindi ka, hindi mo niisip yung magiging effect sa society. Isang example dyan is, If we are able to really um, make uh, artificial music, and if artificial music becomes the norm, do we really like it? Na ma-eliminate ba talaga yung mga true artists? I think not. I think we should be able to, we should eventually go into a new industry, sa music industry na parang magiging pagmimina yung sistema ng paghahanap ng totoong music kasi mapupuno tayo ng mga artificially generated music. Pero yung totoong music na may totoong artistic value, may totoong musical value, will be like uh, true diamonds na kailangan pang hukayin sa kailalima ng mundo <laughs> para maging talagang valuable. I think that's that's the way that we need to look into it. And um, from change management perspective, I think the knowledge build up and bridging the knowledge gap na yung tinatrabaho mo sa ngayon sa prompt engineering uh, yun yung magiging effect nun I think that's the that's really the first step that we everybody should should really do but we need to figure out the next step after that and what's the next step when you when we are able to bridge the knowledge gap the next step is we should be able to decide and we should be able to make choices na talagang consider natin holist, yung holistic uh, scenario and then yung long-term perspective. Using what, the knowledge that we are able to build. And then after that is kailangan naman na kung meron na tayong good knowledge build up, we should learn to collaborate well with one another. Human to human, human to machines, machine to machine, and then continuous improvement around that dynamics. I think we can do a lot and we will be able to figure it out. And I think change management will be viable for that scenario. <laughs> I'm going to make a good bet on that. Thank you, Doc. Yeah, and I think that's a good as play, uh, place uh, as any to end it for now. No? Yep. Uh, sabi ko nga, Leon, dami natin pa pag usapan So I want to thank you for sparing the time, sharing your insight. Yeah, and I look forward to talking with you more about AI and ge generative AI and, and change management no, in the in the days to come. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Doc. And I'm sure, yes, marami pa tayong pwedeng pag-usapan and I'm sure mas magiging concrete siya as we evolve uh, the next into the next episodes. <laughs> Thank you, Doc. Uh, 